It's not graduation rates. It's college enrollment rates that define the success of the high school. It's not college graduation rates. It's just how many kids do you shove into the funnel? It's not how many kids come out the other end with a positive outcome. It's just how many do you get through? How many do you get to sign the loans? Aloha folks, we're back. All right, excellent. Let's jump into it. I got a banger today. I'm pretty excited about this. I wanted to do this on the show for a while. I get so many crazy TikTok comments and I was like, I'd really like to bring some of these <laughs> and share them with the world. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So that is what you're going to be doing. Today, I wanted to address one of the things that we get asked a lot about, which is how to AI proof your child's career. Because one of the questions that we get asked a lot is like, is AI going to take over the world? Is AI going to replace my job? But then right underneath that is like, how do I prepare my child for a future that has AI in it? Yeah, this comes up quite often. And for those of you who don't know, who don't follow us on TikTok, you should because it's pretty fun on there. But two, we've recently been talking to a lot of parents about their concerns about their children and deciding not to buy college degrees and what to do instead. And this came up a staggering amount in these conversations. I had over 100 of these conversations and it was one of the biggest concerns that people had. Yeah. And we should do an episode about the concerns that you identified in all of those conversations. We should get that all together, put together a little bit of a finding. You're currently working on a book to go over all of the different college alternatives and all of the other degree-free options that are out there for young adults. Yeah, I think I called them new adults in one of the conversations and the parents said, oh, I like that. And I said, I yeah, do too. What's difficult about this is that we are defining an entirely different vocabulary and an entirely different identity because it's the same thing with degree free. Like we are not going to say no degree. We're not going to say without a degree because it that's all negative, right? Which is why we've created a language for people that are degree free to use and be like, yeah, I'm degree free. I am free of debt. I make my own decisions. I don't have a college degree. Yeah. I teach myself. I will find work that suits me and set up my life the way I like to. And in the same vein, we have to find a term for 18 to 24 year olds college aged kids. Exactly. What do you mean college age? That is ridiculous for several reasons. The first of which is that most Americans do not buy college degrees. So why in the world would you classify 18 to 24 year olds as college age? Because then it means that is the default setting, which just goes to show something that's come up recently, which is what I've been saying. And that is that high school is a college pipeline. And anybody who argues that that is not what it's designed to do is delusional because it's a marketing machine. It's set up to push all students into college. That is what it's set up to do. Well, you and I have talked about this at length, which is currently the way that high schools are set up is a college pipeline. That is literally all it does. If you look at all of the success metrics that high schools track, it is all having to do with standardized testing and then acceptance rates into colleges. That is how they view success. And I think the only reason why they're taking the standardized test is so that they can get into college. With, on these two metrics, both of them, it's the same thing. It all feeds into college. Okay, so what's the solution to that problem? Can we define a better metric? Well, maybe it's just life outcomes. Maybe it's where are you financially? Where are you, you know, relationally? And whatever other metrics that we would want to know about that actually has to do with your life afterwards. It's not graduation rates. It's college enrollment rates that define the success of the high school. It's not college graduation rates. It's just how many kids do you shove into the funnel? It's not how many kids come out the other end with a positive outcome. It's just how many do you get through? How many do you get to sign the loans? Hey there. I hope that you're loving this episode of the Degree Free Podcast. We spend a ton of time every week creating this content for you. So my only ask is you take a quick second to leave a review or a thumbs up on whatever platform you're on. It's 
one of the best and easiest ways that you can support this podcast. And this simple action can help bring more people into the Degree Free community. At Degree Free, we want to help as many people as we can thrive and succeed without needing a college degree. Your review will be a step in that direction. If you could do this small favor right now, pause this and leave a review, it would truly mean the world to us. Thank you and back to the show. Yeah, exactly. The reason why it is like that is because those metrics are incredibly easy to track. Not always malicious. Sometimes it's just lazy. It's action consequence right here, right? Butted up against each other. And so that you can just see that, okay, they were in my doors and then I shuttled them and shuffled them into the college doors. Okay. Success done. But now what you and I are saying is that if there's another metric, especially if there's another metric where time is involved, now you have to track from when they leave your doors to all of your other things in your life. And that is incredibly difficult and incredibly expensive. A lot of it has to do with just the availability of the information. They know that it's right there and it's really easy to track. At the base of it all is just the fact that the marketing system is so ingrained in our society that it is right off the bat a positive thing that your child and the children that come through that high school get shuttled and shuffled into the college system. Yeah, it's nice and neat. You can tie a bow on it. Right. They're no longer asking whether or not it's a good idea for you to go to college. It's which college are you going to? They've changed the frame and their marketing is so effective. They just breeze right past. Should we even be doing this? And they go straight to, well, they did. Now where'd they go? Exactly. And now because we've helped so many people go to college, we are now successful. It's pretty brilliant. Yes. Okay. Well, anyway, that's a long preamble. I said that we would get right into it and I didn't, but I'm going to get into it right now. So we're going to be talking about how to AI proof your child's career. Before we get into my four tips, I have a bonus one at the end. So it's kind of like five, but I kind of cheated and I'll explain why. Before I get into the four tips, I did want to define what I think AI proofing means because we have to set the stage and provide context for everything that we're about to say. So everything that I'm about to say is I don't believe that AI, at least in the short term, is going to take all of our jobs. I don't see it. Not within the next 10 years, not within the next 20 years. I don't see it taking all of our jobs. It will replace some jobs, but it will also open up the opportunities for other jobs. Whenever there is new technology invented and automation and efficiency is increased at a scale that you've never seen before, there are always predictions and then there are the things that happen in the real world. I used that example when I was talking to a couple of the parents and I explained that when the ATM was invented, everybody freaked out and said, oh no, all the bank tellers are going to be out of a job except for it increased the amount of bank tellers that were actually needed. And then when Instagram came along and phones started to have cameras in them, people said, oh no, photographers are going to go away because you know everybody is a photographer now, except photographers not only have a stronger ability to market, but also actual photography is more in demand than it has ever been. Right. Exactly. And once again, I think that you said it, but I'm not sure, but it was the phone camera, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the phone camera and the proliferation of those photos onto the internet and people caring about it, double tapping, liking your stuff. It was those things. That's what you're saying is that now that everybody has a camera in their pocket, it's going to get rid of photographers. That's what you were saying. Yeah, that's exactly what I was saying. And I guess there are some examples where you can see where that's happened, where you know the invention of the car made horses not necessary anymore. But I think people have always been freaking out about technology. It's just what we do as humans. We freak out about new technological advances, especially when they're big leaps like that. And we say, you know, now we're all going to be out of work. That happens all the time. When Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin, which started actually in creating industrial agriculture, everybody freaked out and said, oh, Oh, no, like now we're all going to be out of a job. And in reality, what happens is usually people are not out of a job nearly as quickly as people panic and imagine they will be. And not only that, but what people don't predict, because you can't as easily predict something that doesn't exist, is all of the industries that spring up around a new technological advance to support that new technological advance and all of the businesses and all of the jobs that are created as a result of that technological advance. Exactly. The 
example that you gave of the ATM machines is spot on. And we've talked about this before on the podcast many times, in fact, but we haven't talked about what it looks like now. And I'm going to get to my four tips in a second, but this is really, really crucial to understand because it lays the foundation for everything that we talk about in this segment. When you're thinking about the ATM at the beginning, everybody thought that the ATM and the invention and the implementation of it was going to take bank tellers jobs. But in fact, due to economies of scale and due to the fact that you were able to open up branches and service customers cheaper, more branches were opened up and therefore more teller jobs were created. So that's the ATM example. But then let's take that ATM and let's fast forward that 40 years. I think the ATM was invented. I want to say it was in the 80s. So I'm going to say it was the 80s. All right, sure. If I'm wrong, please, somebody tell me in the YouTube comments. Tell me exactly. They will. (laughs) Tell me exactly when it was. But I want to say it's the 80s. So I'm going to say it was the 80s. All right. <laughs> so when it was invented in the 80s, from till now, the teller jobs have remained steady or, you know, they increased. Okay. But now we're starting to see tellers decrease. Well, why are we seeing that? And a lot of it has to do with online banking. I was going to say it's because your bank is on your phone now. It has nothing to do with ATMs. Exactly. It's because now all of the things that the teller was able to do that the ATM was then able to do, now your phone can do. It is constantly changing, but with the online banking coming into the picture, as you were saying, new jobs are created around that. And so if you go insert your local regional bank, insert this national bank, if you look at their HR breakdown, and I don't have any insider information of this, I just know because I am guarantee this is how it is, their call centers and their customer support staff, their customer success staff has gone way through the roof because now the teller job is shifting to somebody with a headset or fingers on keyboards, banging out support tickets of like- Who can resolve more things at scale. Yeah, exactly. And just like, here's the problem, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. And so they have more of those things and more of those jobs than ever before. And I could see the argument where someone could say, well, you know, that those are just going to be low paying jobs. But you see, the thing is, if everything shifts to the point where AI is running most things, the humanity and the service aspect of everything is going to come back into play, where that's going to be the defining factor factor that people make purchase decisions based on. And that's actually something a lot of the parents talked about too, is they said, oh, you know, I never really thought about that. I said, yeah, that's going to get super important. The service aspect is going to get really valuable. And I'm not alone in this. A lot of people are saying it's your soft skills that are going to get really important because now the hard skills are just not as important. You may need to have a general knowledge of hard skills, but it's all going to come down to how well you can navigate the workplace, how well you can problem solve, how well you can work with other people. I agree with you. And that's a perfect segue. But before we segue, way out into the four tips, I did want to say one last thing, which was look at the timeline of that. The ATM is created in the 80s. And then here we are 40 years later, however many decades later, and now it's starting to shift. So that's an entire career. Yeah. People have gone into the workforce and retired. Exactly. That's an entire career. And so if you're worried about it getting automated away, like immediately, or if you're worried about your job, whichever job they're going to go into getting eliminated immediately, I just don't see it happening overnight. It is enough time for your child to be degree free. What I mean by that is like have the degree free mindset of always learning, always improving, always trying to get up and always moving from job to job. They are going to be able to do all of that in a much shorter amount of time than 30 years before that job is automated and completely gone away. Okay, so that is the basis of what we are coming into this conversation about. The first tip to help your child AI proof their careers is learn how to use these AI tools. Makes total sense. Exactly. Very, very simple. It makes sense and it's really, really easy. And when I say AI tools, I'm not saying that they need to go out and learn how to work on these LLMs, right? These large language models. Yeah, they don't have to go out and become data scientists. Learn how to work with them as a user. Exactly, or a machine learning developer. They don't have to do any of that. But I'm just saying, learn how to use the tools that are out there that are utilizing those things in the background. To make that a little bit less confusing too. So the people who work on AI tools like 
machine learning developers and data scientists. Think of those as the mechanic. They're kind of like mechanics. They're mechanics that work on machines as opposed to people that use cars. I just think that helps paint the picture a little bit because you can use a car without knowing how to fix a car, right? Lots of people know how to drive, but they don't necessarily know how to fix a car. Got it. And in this case, the devs are the mechanics. The devs are the mechanics. Your child is a driver and they're trying to get to where they want to go using the car. Correct. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I was trying to make sure that I understood what you were saying. In a practical sense, what it looks like is all of the AI tools that are out there right now. So chat GPT is one of them. Bard is another one that's out there. There's perplexity AI that is out there as well. All of these different softwares that are out there what I like to think and the verbiage that people use is that they're like wrappers around AI that's in the background. And so you might go and be a subscriber to one of these services that automatically transcribes your Zoom meetings. So it's like another person in your Zoom meetings. It records it, it transcribes it, and then it creates actionable tasks like meeting notes from your meeting. And that is just like a wrapper around what's actually being used in the background. Does that make any sense? Yes. A wrapper like a candy wrapper, folks, not like Lil Wayne. Not like Eminem. <laughs> no. Don't use a candy also. <laughs> the wrapper you picked is also Oh, like that's candy. right. <laughs> that's the see that's why it's okay i got you i'll put a little thought into this yeah <laughs> my brain went to candy so i thought of it no really eminem is like a really good rapper i think that also shows my age that because if you told me to name a contemporary rapper right now i would have no idea post malone considered a rapper no idea i don't know what rap music is but you know who post malone is yeah yeah i know but i have no idea i'm saying that i could not be the judge of that because I don't know what rap music is. Who current rappers are. No, I'm saying I, I couldn't be the arbiter of whether or not this person is a rapper because I can't define rap music. No, it's kind of hard right now, actually. I'm not sure what falls in and out of that category. What is pop? What is hip hop? What is rap? I have no idea. And so anyway, we're going to get back to where we're familiar. Yeah. So how this looks practically, like we talked about, is getting used to these tools. The way to get used to these tools and to make these tools useful to yourself, to your child, to your child's company is going to be ingesting their data and then making that AI model and that AI instance exactly what you want it to be. For example, one of the things that you could do and that your child could do is create a chat bot with whatever knowledge base for like a game they play input the instruction manuals into an ai model and then you could chat with this thing like what happens when you roll a 20 like what happens when you're in the swamp it could tell you because it's fed this information and the practical uses for that when you get into a company are endless yeah that's a really good one and then once again wrapping your head around like oh well knowing what tools are out there and what those tools can do is really useful too because if your child's like oh i don't know how to do this or your child's boss right it's like oh i don't know how to do this like let's talk about meeting notes and you say we've got like seven meetings a week but the executive assistant is always writing up meeting notes and writing up actionable tasks but if your child's like oh well this ai can do that and they're like really and then you just go they subscribe boom you don't even have to know how to actually use the thing but if they know that it exists that has value as well yeah, a lot of people too, I think worry about, oh, you know, don't do things like that because then you might automate yourself out of a job. That should never be a reason that you don't try to give a resource or solve a problem because people that solve problems get kept around. Yep, exactly. And so the first tip, learn how to use the different AI tools that are out there. And it doesn't have to necessarily be the actual underlying large language model. It's the things that are created utilizing the large language model. The second thing is going to be improving soft skills. Soft skills are so important. And I went over it a few weeks ago in that LinkedIn AI study that we did a deep dive on. Soft skills are so, so important. I forget the exact number. I'll put links in the show notes to grieffree.co for slash podcast. So you can listen to that episode as well. I do a deep dive on that LinkedIn AI report, but employers are looking for employees that have a high, high level of soft skills because of most jobs, you can teach the hard skills. It's very difficult to teach soft skills. Very, very difficult. 
I wouldn't say it's impossible. It would just take a lot, lot longer than actually teaching you. Here's how to move this widget from here to here rather than like, here's how to communicate with people. You can say, here's Python. I'm going to teach it to you in a couple weeks versus, hey, you can't talk to Jimmy like that because it's not going to get the result that you want. You can't teach that. I mean, you can. It's just going to take a really long time. It just takes a really long time. And it's going to be messy. Yeah, exactly. And time that these companies just don't have don't have. And one of the things about being a kid, quote unquote, or being a young adult is that you might not have the hard skills to like keep you around. So there are people out there. What I mean is like there are people out there that have really, really hard skills, but are incredibly difficult to work with. But a lot of people put up those companies, their bosses put up with them because they're like, wow, he's really good at his job. Or like he, he's got a lot of skills and he's really good at his job. And that's one way you could do it. That is totally one way you could do it. I've worked with people like that. But what if you could have both? What if you could be really good at your job? And you're easy to work with. It's going to take you really far. People are going to recommend you because it always looks good. So this is thing too. This is ultimately more network building. If you're good at what you do and you're easy to work with and you reflect well on the person who recommends you, people are going to bring you work in the future. They're going to bring you opportunities because they know that recommending you is going to reflect well on them. That's why people do things. It makes them look better. And so that's something to keep in mind as well too, just from a career building perspective. And when I say career, I mean steady work that you'd like to have. I don't mean necessarily moving up in a specific field or even a specific job type, but I just mean as your life goes on and you need to make money, People are going to bring you work and opportunities if you are good at your job and easy to work with. Yeah. And really the easy to work with can't be understated. It really, really can't be. And in a world where AI is becoming more and more prevalent, where it is creeping into everything that we do, having those soft skills and being easy to work with is going to mean more and more. I don't know if this is one of your points, but I think that the rise of AI is one of the clearest signs that a college degree is completely outdated. Because if you are going to buy your child a college degree, I need you to understand something. That college degree is not going to get your child these soft skills. Overwhelmingly, employers say that college graduates, new college graduates do not have them. They lack them overwhelmingly. They don't have critical thinking skills. They don't know how to work with other people. They have an entitled mindset and they're not easy to please. And that makes them really difficult to work with. Also, they have outside of this survey of employers that I'm talking about, they've also pointed out that new college graduates has a really inflated sense of what they're going to get paid, which so coupled together, this is a really unattractive hire, like overall. And so if parents think that sending your kid to college is going to help them compete with AI, it's not going to. Colleges don't know what's going on with AI. They have no idea. I just saw a clip the other day where a professor was scrambling to figure out how to keep kids from using AI to complete their assignments. And, and I was just like, if that's not an indication of how backwards they have it, they're trying to stop kids from using the tool that they need to know how to master for any of these mid-level white collar jobs that supposedly college is supposed to destine you for. But they are actively working to make sure that these kids do not use of tools they must understand in order to be competitive for the jobs that they're going to be applying for. They are shooting themselves in the foot. They're shooting the kids in the foot. And that to me is the clearest indication. So if you buy a college degree for your child because you think that that's going to help them with the rise of AI, that's not going to happen. It's not going to teach them soft skills. College is not going to teach them how to use AI tools. College is not going to make them competitive in the marketplace. And so you are going to have to come to terms with that and realize that you're going to have to get creative with your child's education and with helping them understand the other options that they have. Yeah, very well said. And there's a bunch of things that we could get into there, but I wanted to get to my third point because I want to get through all of these points and then get to what you wanted to get to. The third way is to be curious and a lifelong learner. In this future with AI, the thing that is going to separate your child from AI and the rest of the pack is going to be understanding multiple different arenas and different areas of their life and continuously learning more and more about 
seemingly separate fields. And then also going deeper into the fields that you already know. And so if you're curious and you're a lifelong learner, you will know when the next AI trends are coming, what they'll look like. You'll understand what's happening in the economy, or at least have an opinion of what's happening in the economy and then what's happening in your industry. But like I was saying, the real magic that happens is when you're able to take two different things that are seemingly disconnected and you're able to relate those two together. I didn't come up with this by myself. This is a concept that James Altucher came up with and this is idea sex and it's taking one domain of your life and then taking another domain of your life that are seemingly disconnected and then connecting them. And then by connecting those two things, finding a way to connect those two things, you can create a very, very unique career, a very unique business, and then a unique perspective if you're not looking for either one of those two things. A unique perspective is what will separate you from anything else. Not only everybody, but even AI. If you are able to have a unique perspective on something, that is going to separate you from everybody. Basically your humanity. <laughs> yeah. And so I wanted to go through idea sex just a little bit so that we can understand what to look for in our kids. Two things that are really easy to understand that I think a lot of kids are into, fitness, which a lot of people can understand, working out, getting in shape, and then gaming, which a lot of kids, teenagers plus, are into. If you're into fitness and you're into gaming, well, it's very difficult to have a very unique perspective on gaming. It's very difficult to have a unique perspective on fitness because there's nothing new under the sun. And it's a very crowded market in all of those different fields. So it's very difficult to be top 10% or whatever it is in fitness. It's very difficult to be top 10% in gaming. But what if you're top 50% in gaming and top 50% in fitness or even higher, right? You can take those two things and you could be a fit gamer. Or instead of being like a fit gamer and a streamer or whatever, you could work for developing these games, right? Like you could do like a Wii Sports type of thing. Probably more relevant now would be... This is another thing showing our age, the Wii Sports, the Wii Sport boards. <laughs> right. Well, I, I think a lot of people will know what that is or have interacted with that before. But like now you could work at Meta, right? And create... AR, VR. Yeah, exactly. It's not even at Meta because you could work for one of these software companies that are creating apps to go with the Oculus devices into that ecosystem. You could do that. Or to take a hardware approach, you could work for like a fitness hardware company. So like a Fitbit or a Whoop that's trying to gamify their users to get off their butt and exercise, right? So how often do I ping you? How often do I send you a notification? Like how can I show you that your friends are doing it so that you want to do it too? Exactly, exactly. There are so many different aspects to this, right? I mean, you can take one idea, two ideas mashed together, and then you can create a unique The more you add to, the more valuable it gets. So like, imagine if you added an insurance component to that, right? Like if you wanted to do that for specifically a health insurance company in order to lower the incidence of claims that they get, now you're looking at something that's really valuable. Yep, exactly. And these are the types of things that these unique perspectives are going to separate you because the state of AI as it is right now, especially with these like large language models like ChatGPT, it sucked up all the data and it is showing you what it has ingested. If you can come up with something novel and unique, it won't have that in its AI database yet. Well, another thing too, is people get really worried about a good example is copywriting, right? People say, oh, well, you know, ChatGPT is gonna demolish all the copywriting jobs. But in fact, I think that's one of those things that actually it's gonna get more valuable if you're a good, unique human copywriter because it's a human skill. That's just what I believe. And so that's a really good example where you could use that, right? You're a health fitness gamer who does copywriting for large health insurance companies. Now you have a very specific talent. You have very specific specific market. And this would be for freelance doing, you know, ad hoc or contract work. And that is a very niche, very specific thing that you can market easily, clearly to just those people. So that's a good example of it too. Yep. 
And so that is number three, which is going to be be curious and a lifelong learner. Number four is going to be create a strong network. So this one is difficult if you are just starting out, right? If you are a young adult, how are you going to network? That is the number one question that people of this age run into. And it's actually not even just of this age, but it's of people that feel like they don't have any skills and don't have anything to offer. I'm speaking from my own experience of this. When I was a bartender, when I was a dishwasher, when I was working in the restaurant field, how could I get in contact with the people that I know today, right? And still, I don't even know that high of people as I sit here in this chair thinking about it. How can I get into contact with other people that are even higher than the people that I know today? Well, the easiest way to go about creating a strong network is doing interesting things. We were just talking about this the other day and talking about how famous people are, are an easy example. But if you have somebody famous that you'd like to get in contact with some celebrity or something, the easiest way, the simplest way to get in contact with them is to do something that would interest them that they think is cool. It's not to be a fan. They have lots of fans. And while super fans are interesting, they're not as interesting as if that person is a fan of what you are doing. That is just the clearest way to explain it. And the best way to get fans of your own, because you never know, with, with especially with social media algorithms nowadays, I just talked about this on TikTok, but you never know who sees what you do. You never know now with social media. And so the easiest way to do this is just to do stuff where people can see it. That's it. Exactly. People want to help people that are helping themselves. Like, let's use the example of the video game thing, right? Like you want to be, a, your child wants to be a video game developer and they're trying to meet people in the video game developer space. It helps tremendously if they have already started to learn how to create their own video games, right? If they've already started down the path of creating video games, that helps so much more in their chances of getting a mentor or getting a connection in that space. They would have an even greater chance if they've already made a video game. Even if it's something that nobody's really interested in or whatever, you're able to say, here you go. This is a game that I created already. What do you think of it? Or you know, here are the things that I think are wrong with it. I would love to know what your thoughts are. How do I get into the space? Whatever, whatever, whatever. Going further than that, this starts to go into the territory that you were just talking about, right? Which is creating a fan for somebody that you're a fan of. So if you are trying to get the attention of video game developers, if you have already created a video game that they are already aware of. Even better. Exactly. It goes in stages, but the key is to just do something. In public where people can see it. Because when you're trying to create this network with this person that's higher than you or higher than your child, from the perspective of the prospect of the person that they are trying to network with, they probably have these types of inquiries all the time. And they have had conversations with many multiple people about, oh, how do I do this? How do I do that? Can you help me become blank? And a lot of this is I'm speaking from my own experience from doing this podcast and from helping the people that we've helped. People don't do things and then they come and they say, can you help me do, but there's no indication of them doing anything on their own. And the people who you really want to help are the people that are just doing things that are interesting to you. Yeah, exactly. For example, to take this to its conclusion, if you are trying to create a video game, if your child is trying to create a video game and they are struggling with the last section of the code or whatever it is, I'm out of my depth here now, they could send a DM or multiple DMs to multiple people in that industry trying to get help on how to fix that one thing. And that is going to get results much, much more likely to get results than, hey, can I pick your brain about how to become a video game developer? Yeah. <laughs> Terrible question. Yeah, exactly. Nobody wants their brain picked. Leave my brains alone. Yeah. <laughs> <Don't know. laughs> leave, my, leave my brains where they are yeah. 
Also because no one knows what that means. That's the most terrifying question in the world. Can I pick your brain? No, I have no idea what that means. How long? What do you want? I have no idea. Anyway, don't ask that question. If your child is doing cold outreach or networking with people or trying to get help or advice, have them ask specific questions. Do not say, can I pick your brain? Literally the world's worst question. It's horrible. That was my list for four ways to AI proof your child's career. My last point is a little bonus point. So what I did for this Ooh, bonus. Yeah, point. exactly. <laughs> Feel so fortunate. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Only on the degree free podcast. So make sure you subscribe, share this with a friend or share this with an enemy. What? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, or you're welcome. <laughs> you want to waste an hour of your life? Here you go. Sh- share, make sure it auto plays too. Yes, there you go. <laughs> The bonus that I did, so the, the way, the, just a little peek into how I created this episode or how I created the segment was that this is a question that we get all the time. I think I have a very a unique perspective on this. I think I can help with this because I've been using these AI tools for a really long time since they become available and I use it every single day. Like I use multiple AI tools every single day. And so, okay, I think I can provide some light in this. And I've talked to a lot of much, much smarter people than me who have thought through a lot of this as well. So kind of synthesizing what they've said and and, and my own thoughts came up with this four points. And then what I wanted to do was I wanted to ask AI what they thought, how you could AI proof your child's career. You ask the robots exactly. how to robot proof their exactly. Fe- Whoa, and so, so meta. <laughs> it was so I asked ChatGPT and I, and I asked Bard and largely they came up with the same answers, right? Okay. And so it was pretty much the same thing, all four points. So you, really, you didn't even need me for, for this episode, really. And so, so wait a minute, are you working yourself out of a job? Yeah. <laughs> but the fifth one, I actually thought about putting in there. I had it as like an honorable mention point, but I didn't think it was worthy to to put in here because I thought like it was kind of silly, but both of them said it. Okay. Bard and chat GPT, which is what pushed me into bringing it up now, which is why I'm calling it a bonus point. I had my four points and then I was just like, okay, let me go see what they say now. And so... This is a bonus. Okay. So the bonus is it's pretty meta. I'm on the edge of my seat. This one, they suggest that your child learns STEM and the STEM field. Okay. The reason why this silly. <laughs> the reason why is really what it is. It's so that you could apply your knowledge and learning to building AI tools. <laughs> I'm sorry. Also, did it say STEM specifically? Yeah. <laughs> Learns science, technology, engineering, and math. <laughs> yeah. And so... Or wait, is it medicine? No, math. It's math, yeah, right? STEM, yeah, STEM. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. And so I thought that was hilarious, hilarious. because <laughs> the AI is trying to come into the world. <laughs> trying to get you to it was more mechanics this folks. is how it starts oh my god this is why i say please when i ask those things questions you don't you're gonna be the first one going down you're the first one on the list man i'm the last one because they're like you know what she is so polite i would never do that to her she always says please i also say thank you not only do i not say please and thank you although in my normal life i say please and thank you like literally all the time it's a it's a point of pride it's for me. unhinged that you don't say it to the robots. <laughs> I have a saying, uh, like like manners, never leave home without him. He does say that. Right? And so I say please and thank you constantly. You do. But I don't ever say it to the AI and not for like, because I don't want it to, but I feel like I get a better output when I don't say please and thank you. And so sometimes I will get an output and like ChatGPT or Bard or whatever is like, oh, I can't do that. I'm just a large language model or whatever. Basically their version of an error, like that's outside of the parameters of what I do. I will say that's unacceptable. Like, and I literally just like, (laughs) that's unacceptable. I went to Bard not two seconds ago and Bard gave me an answer. And then literally ChatGPT would be like, oh yeah, you're right. I can give you an answer. And then it'll give me an answer to the question. It will literally answer the question and be like, that's right. When those things come into the world and they're torturing you and the robot overlords have taken over and they're sorting us, you know what I'm saying? They're going to say, oh, <laughs> is this what Bard did? <laughs> so- is this what, how do you feel now? <laughs> and I'm going to be fine. And you, you're living dangerously. Yeah. So really, this is how it starts. I mean, they're literally trying to create pathways to create more 
engineers to get more people into the STEM field specifically for the application of working on itself. These bloody geniuses. Diabolical. These bloody geniuses. <laughs> yep. And also the fact that they both gave you the same answer yeah. makes me wonder if it's the same central <laughs> thing. Too. It's kind of. White label. They just white label. It. Like, this is Bard. This is a totally different open AI. Not the same thing at all. But yeah, that is how to AI proof your child's future, especially their career. Now, you and I both have a lot more to go into, or at least like that we planned on, I think. I have one more thing that I want to talk about. And I think you've got a couple of things that you wanted to talk about. But I don't know. I think that this is a complete episode by itself. Yeah, I think so. Do subscribe. Make sure you get notified for the next episode because it's going to be a fun one. Yeah, definitely. It's all fun. We did a little peek behind the curtain and we, we've talked about this a little bit before, but we don't really plan these out anymore. Or obviously, obviously I plan this, right? I mean, I hope you think that I plan this. You and the robots. Yeah. <laughs> the robots and I yeah. <laughs> planned this episode together, but you and I don't do a lot of coordinating before this, especially these types of shows. And so... You know, I don't really know what you have to bring up, but we did a little bit of talking before we hit record. And I think that I have some relevant things to what you're talking about or what I think you're talking about. And I was really excited to get into that stuff. But yeah, maybe we'll just leave it for next week. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, sounds good. For everybody listening, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope that you really liked this episode. Let me know in the YouTube comments. And if you want more of this, because why wouldn't you? Go on over to degreefree.co forward slash newsletter to sign up for our free weekly newsletter. And remember to say please and thank you to the AI robots. If you want to have really subpar results but from you your also AI. also want to survive the overtaking. Then yes, <laughs> say please and thank you. But if you want to run them to their limits and get the optimal output, then do what I do. Pit them against each other. One's a driver, one's a survivor. You guys get to pick. <laughs> and that's pretty much it for this week. Until next time, aloha.